And it's my great pleasure to introduce a very distinguished guest uh, tonight, Sir Fraser Stoddart. Uh, Sir Fraser is a leading practitioner of supramolecular chemistry and nanotechnology. He was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1942 received his Bachelor of Science uh, in 64 and PhD in 66, degrees, both degrees from the University of Edinburgh. He moved to the University of Birmingham in 1990 and headed the University School of Chemistry from 1993 there, until he moved in 97 to UCLA, uh, California. In 2009, he joined Northwestern as professor, member of the Board of Trustees and director of the Center for Chemistry and Integrated Systems. Professor Fraser Stoddart is also a fellow of the Royal Society, the German Academy of Natural Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the Science Division of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. His work has been recognized with many awards. He was knighted by the Queen of England and received in 2007 the King Faisal International Prize in Science. He also received the 2007 Tetrahedron Prize for Creativity Creativity in Organic Chemistry, and the 2008 Arthur C. Cope Award for the American Chemical Society, among others. According to the ISI, which is the Institute for Scientific Information, Professor Stoddart is the third most cited chemist in the world. He has more than 60 major international honors and named lectureships under his belt. Um, he has authored or co-authored nine books and more than 900 articles and has delivered more than 700 invited lectures around the world. So for his 701st or thereabouts lecture, please welcome Sir Fraser Stoddart to the stage. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming this evening. I'm sure there are many competing uh, events that uh, you could be attending or watching this evening. Um, I would like to uh, start by uh, just mirroring the comments of uh, Philip Kennedy about uh, the um, devastation that hit uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States just before I left, uh, and in particular to empathize with uh, those of you who have strong connections with uh, NYU. Um, I'm sure there are many in the audience, um, and, and hope that, uh, that the real, real spirit of uh, uh, recovery uh, will uh, come strongly through, as I'm sure it will, because uh, New Yorkers, at least, are um, renowned for uh, recovering from all kinds of uh, events that uh, visit their city. Uh, secondly, I want to uh, thank uh, the people at the Institute here and the members of the Chemistry Department for the invitation to visit Abu Dhabi for the first time. Uh, this has been, quite frankly, a mind-blowing experience and I uh, have lived in awe of what I've feasted my eyes on uh, these past few days. I do apologize for the fact that I'm recovering from a heavy cold and have had uh, some voice problems of late, but uh, mercifully, my voice is almost back, so please bear with me. So what I want to do this evening is to um, try to put chemistry in the uh, light that I see it. This is the youngest of the sciences. It's not the oldest, it's the youngest. And to illustrate that, I make the point that if we take the atoms, they are the letters. If we take the words, these are what we call the molecules. And if we take a few phrases that we put together with the words, these are the so-called super molecules. And this December, the chemical community celebrates the 25th anniversary of the Nobel Prize to three scientists, three chemists, who effectively put so-called supramolecular chemistry on the map, uh, that prize being pre presented uh, in December of uh, 1987. So returning to my theme, we in chemistry have effectively reached the stage of uttering a few phrases. So I ask you to put this in the context of a human being. It is no more than about 12 to 18 months old, coming out with the young child, its few words, 
uh, but still not able to put sentences together. And so this is where chemistry is today. We still need to learn the grammar to be able to write sentences. We are a distance away from writing paragraphs. Chapters are just dreams, and books are out there almost in the unreachable, it would seem, but not quite. So the message I really want to put across the first one is we're looking at a very young scientist, science with huge opportunities for young people in the audience who might want to take up science in the expression of chemistry. The second point I want to make very forcibly tonight is you cannot plan research, good research. It happens by chance. And so I've picked two themes tonight where serendipity plays an enormous role in the opening up of two research areas. In other words, the researchers involved were trying to do something else, um, which of course is part of a research plan, but it was the unexpected that uh, really gave us major breakthroughs. So on that basis, <coughs> I want to first of all <coughs> make a comment about the need for chemistry to become robust. Chemistry has been practiced in solution, in water, in solvents, um, in the solid state for a century or more. Uh, <clears throat> and that will continue. But we need to get ourselves redirected towards more complex situations where we do chemistry at surfaces and on, uh, or on surfaces and at interfaces. And we're faced with roughly the same challenge that the people who uh, pioneered flight were at the turn of the last century. And so it's well known to you in the audience here that the birds and the bees and the bats have been practicing flight from time immemorial. As I say, it's only in the last, actually, 50 years that we've been in any way successful at uh, manned flight. And you see some examples here. If we take the one up on the top here, fellow Scotsman, Lord Kelvin, towards the end of the 19th century, very eminent physicist, went on record as saying there would never be manned flight. And so, <clears throat> coming back to my comment about chemistry, the things that we think about that could never be have to be seen in the context of now, at any one time, there'll be half a million passengers in the air being transported across our planet. So I hope I give you some historical perspective about where I think chemistry is sitting today and also, as I say, in the human context. No more than a young child starting to utter the first few phrases. We have a long way to go. This is an enormously young and vibrant science. So to introduce um, my topics tonight, I want to take up the theme of robustness and tell you how, in a planned way, we started to enter several years ago, maybe about five years ago now, the area of what are called three-dimensional structures. So these are structures where, um, <clears throat> in chemical terms, we can call them nanoporous, which means they're full of holes. Um, the bits and pieces are joined together, and the bits and pieces make a long chain um, going in three dimensions. And coming back to this descriptor of the molecule, um, in the best situations, the molecule is the crystal, and the crystal is the molecule. And this can be millimeters um, in size in terms of a cubic structure, for example. As I say, these are very open structures. And they're full of holes, they're ultra porous, but they're strong. And it's the robustness that attracted us to these structures. Now, they've been on the go now since the early 90s. And the early practitioners have shown that they're very good for storing gases, uh, like hydrogen and methane, uh, the possibility of storing these gases to uh, replace uh, <coughs> petroleum in vehicles. Um, 
the sequestration of carbon dioxide from the uh, air, which of course is very much linked to the greenhouse effect and climate change. Um, <clears throat> they've been used for separations and they've been used to catalyze reactions, that is make the reactions uh, go faster. But if we go below this line here, uh, what has not happened is they've not uh, been <coughs> added to in terms of the sophistication of um, having parts that recognize other molecules or putting small switches into them. And so it, it was the desire to uh, create what we call molecular recognition and molecular switching that took us into this area. And basically it's a challenge in what I call concept transfer. So we create materials that are capable of robust dynamics, um, as is shown at the bottom here, by combining these nanoporous uh, frameworks, or sometimes they're called metal organic frameworks, or MOFs for short, with switchable uh, two-state um, mechanically interlocked molecules. And here you see these uh, two simple uh, <coughs> representations of a switch based on uh, two rings that are mechanically interlocked. This is often referred to as a catenane from uh, the Latin catena for chain. And marrying these together, these so-called MIMPs for short, um, we have a situation where the former, namely the MOFs, will endow the materials with well-defined porous structures and the latter with switchability that you can bring about just by a very small uh, voltage. The same voltage as is present in this uh, pointer that I'm using, around about two volts, three volts. And so <coughs> this was our goal, to create switches, um, to address the um, challenge that the uh, semiconductor industry is going to face in the foreseeable future, what is often called the end of the roadmap. Uh, can uh, <coughs> the chips that are in our cell phones and uh, the other gadgets we use, our GPS systems and so forth, uh, will they continue to half in size every um, 18 months and will the price continue also to uh, be cut in half every month? That's not going to happen unless we see the, the burgeoning of a new technology. And so this is what's driving that piece of research. And so our first foray into this area was very simple. Uh, we used a straight rod here, uh, which ends up being uh, displayed in this cube, uh, with a red ring, which represents a receptor site uh, for certain other uh, molecules. And we used known chemistry to bring together in joints, which are represented by these uh, blobs in gold here, where oxygen is in the middle, and the oxygen is surrounded by four zincs and attached to those in an octahedral way. And so this means at right angles, so that we have this situation and also that situation. Um, these so-called struts, which give us this cube arrangement. And then this cube is repeated right throughout the crystal. Uh, trillions, billions uh, of, of these uh, in even a small crystal. As I said, the molecule is the crystal and the crystal is the molecule. And so, <coughs> having made this first uh, <coughs> metal organic framework with these receptor sites, we were anxious to find out, would it interact with anything? And here is an example of a molecule that has found a lot of commercial use in the past. Uh, ICI, uh, this company, uh, marketed it as a wipeout weed killer. Um, it's actually been taken off the market now because of toxicity and because of there being better uh, uh, weed killers uh, that are of the wipeout variety. Uh, but it also came, and this was part of its demise, with a downside that if uh, for some reason um, a human being came in contact with it by swallowing some, then um, it, it, it was really a certain death unless uh, uh, certain uh, procedures were uh, put in place. However, from the point of view of tonight, uh, what I have here is a 
solution of paraquat uh, as a particular salt and a suspension of this metal organic framework that I was showing you with these receptor sites. And as we add this solution here, you can see the suspended crystals of the metal organic framework going from yellow to orange. And this means that the paraquat is docking inside these receptors instantaneously. So you see that remarkable change. It happens very quickly because of the porosity of the material. And so basically what we've done here is to take this area of metal organic frameworks or coordination, um, porous coordination polymers from what was a sorting domain where just the orifices in the structure sorted out the uh, gases that would go inside uh, and kept the larger gases outside. Or as the orifice got bigger, um, it was arranged that the gases would uh, stick to the sides. But now, uh, and this is what we call a physical phenomenon, uh, what we've introduced here is a chemical phenomenon where you've seen that red ring uh, interact with the blue component. And so we now have an active domain for the uh, uptake of uh, an, uh, <clears throat> so called um, substrate material by uh, these metal organic frameworks. And so, where we are headed to in this uh, game is to introduce MIMS into MOFs, as I said. So here you see an example of one of the first catenanes that we ever made, two interlocked rings, a blue one and a red one. And our challenge now is to integrate it into this metal organic framework. And as I said, the reason that we are doing this is that we have an interest in molecular electronics that goes back over a decade. And the other um, matter that I want to get over tonight is any big um, research project, um, even in chemistry these days, that is where you're, you're attempting to plan, is a decade's worth of time. Uh, things do not happen overnight. That's a very strong message that um, I do want to get out to the community here in the Middle East, um, because I also interact with uh, scientists in uh, Saudi Arabia. And when it comes to publishing, often um, there is a feeling that um, the um, <clears throat> top places that one tries to publish in, namely nature and science, that you can reach these heights in literally a few weeks. No, no, no. Our last Nature article was three and a half years of going back and forth with the editors in London. It's a very big battle. We've just had one accepted in science. It has been 18 months, and again, the number of emails must be close to 500. So I really do want to get the message over that to excel in science, it is today like being on the tennis circuit or the golf circuit. You have got to practice day and night, and then you've got to have, on top of that, some talent. OK, so having made these comments, we started off um, with um, what we call these bistable catenanes. And <clears throat> we introduced them uh, into uh, polymers, ultimately, having put them into devices where um, <clears throat> another variety, which are these uh, dumbbell-shaped entities, where the ring goes back and forth between the green and the red site to create the switching. Um, in 2007, we had an article in Nature where um, we had memory at the level of 160,000 bits. And that was 400 by 400 wires, in which uh, roughly 250 molecules of these was trapped in a device that is smaller than the cross-section of a red blood cell. But the problem with this design is the lack of robustness. And so this is why this particular area of research has now gone towards these three-dimensional three -dimensional structures um, that we call either uh, <coughs> porous uh, coordination uh, compounds or metal organic frameworks. So that really is giving you the background to why we're in this area. OK, there was planning. And the planning is uh, being followed. Um, in a very logical kind of way, but it's 
taking time to get results. What I want to do now is to step back and tell you the first story of serendipity. Now, what you've been looking at with these metal organic frameworks are compounds that are made exclusively from bits and pieces that have a petrochemical source. And they've been very successful to date in respect of uh, storing gases. And to this extent, they are now um, produced by BSM in Germany, the chemical company, and uh, marketed, at least in the United States, by uh, Aldrich. But as I say, they are all coming from um, what you have a great source of supply of in Abu Dhabi here, oil. The question is, um, could we take these metal organic frameworks into a context where um, they are green uh, to the extent that they're edible? And I'm going to show you how this happened. So the story starts with little pieces of uh, sugar that are presented to us on a plate. Um, every source of starch, be it potatoes or rice or peas or beans, uh, contains a whole series of glucose units that are linked up in a chain. And these are the glucose units that you see represented here. And then the world is full of little tricks. There's a microorganism, Bacillus macerans, which will take these polymer chains, divide the glucose units up into units of six, seven, eight, nine, and that's one enzyme that's present in them. A second one will stitch them together into cycles. And so, as a result, you can produce by the ton this one with six sugar units, called alpha, and we call them CDs for short. Uh, here is beta CD with seven and gamma CD with eight. And very often, uh, this is an attempt to show the um, fact that um, <clears throat> there's a big cavity in the middle here, uh, and it's often very simply represented like a bucket or a pail with a bottom that has been removed. So, <clears throat> as I say, these are produced by bacteria. They've been well studied on the so-called nanoscale because you can see as we go across here, we're leaving um, six angstroms, which is um, effectively where chemistry is. And what I want to also point out is that in terms of nanotechnology, chemistry is starting off at the, part, the, bits, at the bits and pieces sub-nanometer. And so we have this great ability to build from the bottom up to come into the nanometer scale. So we're just about hitting one nanometer here with gamma cyclodextrin. So it's bucket shaped. Um, they're symmetrical insofar as you can spin each glucose unit round and replace it by the next one. And so since we've got eight here, this is an eight-fold axis. This is how we indicate a simple eight-fold axis. <clears throat> so they're also um, symmetrical um, insofar as there is fourfold symmetry and twofold symmetry associated with this particular gamma cyclodextrin. And as I said, they're produced um, on the ton scale in uh, parts of the world not far from where I live now. If I drive out of Chicago into the countryside, then all I see is this uh, high green stuff uh, that um, is called maize. And um, so the cornfields of uh, Illinois, of uh, Iowa, any other states are producing uh, lots of uh, feedstock to make uh, this uh, cyclodextrin. And here's where serendipity comes into play. So Ron Smaldone, who <coughs> graduated from the uh, University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana down in the south of the state, came uh, just over three years ago and joined my group. He's now just left to go and be an assistant professor at uh, the University of Texas at Dallas. And I'm going to mention a few people during the course of my time um, here. Um, and I'm going to do this to illustrate the fact that first and foremost, I am a teacher in a university. The research I do is secondary, but it cannot be too secondary if we're going to have people like Ali Trabolsi uh, come and join you at New York University, Abu Dhabi. It's got to be 
that the research is of the highest order. And the one, one way that we achieve this is it's a bottom-up approach. When the Ali Trabosis come into my lab, I say, the world is your oyster. You go out, here are certain guidelines. You cannot go too far out of these areas. But you come up with your own idea. And he did. And it was world shattering. And the great thing about this is that the young people then take ownership of their ideas. Top down does not work as well as bottom up. That's one of my other messages as you put together this new university at Abu Dhabi. And here's a very great example of bottom up. Ron is taking two <coughs> molecules that are exactly the same here. They happen to be called azobenzene dicarboxylate, and K stands for potassium. And he's wanting to spread these through this bucket. And prior knowledge in the area tells him, yes, there's a very good chance that he can do this. And then he wants to go on and make a structure called the Boromian rings, which again Ali Trabosi is working on here, in a stepwise way where three rings are joined together, such that if you cut any one ring, the whole caboodle falls apart. That was the drive for Ron. But that's not what happened. He got crystals. And Joe Bernstein in the audience here will relate to uh, the power of crystallography, I think. And we send these crystals because we have a collaboration through the EPSRC in the UK with the NSF in the US. And that collaboration involves uh, Alexandra Slowen at St. Andrews University. And it's quite unexpected. We end up with um, a cubic array here. So it's a metal organic framework with six of these cyclodextrins making a cube linked up by these uh, purple potassium ions. And when this surprise hit us, this was a very cryptic email that came from St. Andrews. I see the cyclodextrin, I see four atoms of potassium, I see water, but no other guess. All of this black stuff had just disappeared from the X-ray diffraction pattern. And so here is what uh, had been discovered, namely that uh, these um, cubes are linked up in what we call body-centered cubic manner. There's one in the middle, um, surrounded by four in the front here and four at the back, and then this just extends right out throughout the crystal. So there we are, serendipity playing a big part in the discovery of this remarkable new structure. And so I went around the world starting to talk about it as Bob's your uncle chemistry. Now, some British background in the audience, I hope this phrase is not lost on you. My next slide will fill in that gap. But it's very simple. You take a spoonful of sugar, as Ron did, a pinch of salt and a swig of alcohol, and Bob's your uncle. You've got something that is uh, capable of storing these gases, just as the uh, petrochemically sourced materials are. And you can start now and think in terms of things in the medical field, like delivering drugs or imaging, if we have a um, need for MRI, as it's called, and so on and so forth. Ross Forgan, by the way, who played a big part in this, is now at Glasgow University, fellow Scot, so he returned home. Um, he just starts uh, last month uh, as a Royal Society Research Fellow there. Before that, he was uh, inducted into the Royal Society of Edinburgh, along with some of the very first young scientists and uh, other people from the humanities as the youngest member. So Bob's your uncle, um, common expression in the Commonwealth countries, Britain, Ireland. Um, <clears throat> it really means, and there you have it, um, simply put a piece of ham between two slices of bread and Bob's your uncle. Or in American parlance, you're all set, you've got it made, that's great. It's an expression of jubilation. So there's some stories in Wikipedia and elsewhere about where it came from, but 
I'll share this one with you. The Prime Minister, towards the end of the 19th century in the United Kingdom, was one Lord Salisbury. But his real name was Robert Cecil, or Bob. And one day, his Minister of State for Ireland resigned. And this was quite catastrophic, of course, um, because being the Minister of State for Ireland at those times was a little bit of a poison chalice. So um, he turned to the appointment of his nephew, one uh, Alfred Balfour, I think, um, by name, who has subsequently also became a prime minister. So the Times of London coined the phrase, Bob's your uncle, meaning nepotism. And now, a century or more on, it's given way to something less um, ex <coughs> expressive, perhaps, in some ways, but still expressive in another way, you've got it made. All right, well, for maybe some of the chemists in the audience, let's look a little bit more deeply, but I think I can take everyone with me. Sepia, am I doing my job well? Okay, oh, fine. I had to check this out because she said she would stand up and uh, tell me if I was doing a bad job. So now I'm much more relaxed, thank you. So if we look at this, uh, array around the potassium ion here. First of all, there's eight oxygen, so this is why we call it eight coordinate. And it can be sodium or rubidium or cesium. They all happen to come in one part of the periodic table, the so-called group 1A metals. And this is the repeating unit of the um, um, gamma cyclodextrin. Four of these uh, two um, glucose units, something that's actually called maltose. And as you go around these units, you find on what's called the primary face, a metal ion, let's say a potassium, and then on the next sugar, a metal ion. And the ones that are on this primary face here, they are in the north and south direction here. And they are holding together the cubes of uh, this um, metal organic framework. And as I spin this round, they're holding together the yellow and the red and the green and the blue. And then the red and the yellow and the green and the blue go on to make their cubes. And then that expands throughout this whole network. In the east-west direction, we have coordination to the secondary faces, as they're called. This is this part here. And they are responsible for holding the cubes together. So there is a question here about what happened to that organic component that Ron Smaldon introduced? It just seemed to disappear. And so with a simpler organic component, namely benzoic acid, so this is just benzene with a carboxyl group on it, um, we made the same moth. And then having made it in aqueous alcohol, um, we dissolved it up in water, or more precisely D2O, carried out an NMR spectrum, and showed from the integration of the peaks that um, there was a two to one ratio of the benzoate to the gamma CD. Now, this told us that we are not ionizing any of the um, hydroxyl groups here, and that the potassium benzoate is on a swim around, just like the azobenzene dicarboxylate in the structure at large. And this is quite a remarkable observation in itself because what Ron expected his organic components to do was for a pair of them to go and sit in this uh, donut-like or bucket-shaped cavity. Now we've lost that, and we've lost it because it is no longer one donut swimming around in water. It is these donuts all joined up. And this is what we call in chemistry now emergent behavior. When you put many things together, you get very different properties than from the one piece that uh, you're repeating over and over. All right? So <clears throat> already we see emergent properties uh, coming out of uh, this uh, investigation. Here is a slice through one of these uh, cubes. And here you see the um, channel that is supported, uh, the circular one just under one nanometer by the cyclodextrin. There are also other channels that are triangular in shape. 
And <coughs> the calculated pore volume is uh, about half the structure. So it is very much emptiness, if you like, but still very rigid. Now, we had to establish that we had the right to call them metal organic frameworks. And so there we had to suck out all the water and the alcohol and replace it by a organic solvent, dichloromethane, and use the technique of uh, X-ray diffraction <coughs> excuse me, to show that for the metal organic framework with potassium and the one with rubidium, that after we evacuated, um, the pattern remained sufficiently the same for us to say that the metal organic framework survived. And there were also calculations done uh, to aid and abet this um, conclusion. So I remind you, you take a spoonful of sugar, you take a pinch of salt, you take a swig of alcohol, and Bob's your uncle. And you can do this with potassium, you can do it with rubidium, you can do it with cesium, uh, you can do it with sodium, but that's more or less it, it's restricted to these uh, so-called group 1A metal cations. Now, what about all the space that is in the structure? So that if we look at the one based on potassium and the one based on rubidium, we can measure surface areas using various different techniques that I will not go into. The important thing here is that these numbers are in the same ballpark as some of their competitors. So from the point of view of taking up gases, we have uh, a huge surface area. And one of the best ways of expressing this is that if you were to um, have one kilogram of this material in your hands, and it would be quite bulky because it's very light, then the surface area inside it would cover uh, 200 uh, football fields, soccer pitches, or if I use my Scottish accent, football pitches or fields. Okay, so here was something that was a little unexpected, a surprisingly strong uptake of carbon dioxide. And remember I've said that we really want to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because this increase in carbon dioxide is creating um, a situation where as the sun shines on the uh, carbon dioxide molecules, they vibrate and they let out heat. And so um, we're getting uh, the influence of this on our climate, um, the so-called greenhouse effect. So um, if we take CDMOF2, the one from rubidium, uh, comparing it with uh, methane here, um, a very rapid uptake of carbon dioxide and then a much slower uptake. And what I want to tell you here is that this is chemistry and this is physics, essentially, that we're looking at. And the chemistry part is related to the structure, again, in a very interesting way. So remember this repeating unit. This particular hydroxyl group here is available to form a so-called carbonic acid with uh, carbon dioxide. Now, if we just have gamma cyclodextrin by itself, it does not happen. This only happens when we build this massive great Hilton. If we just have the bungalow, it doesn't work, all right? So again, we have an emergent effect um, where the carbon dioxide forms a chemical bond making a carbonic acid. Now remember the acid part, we're going to use that as proof that we can make it. And what's more, it all happens at room temperature. So you can bring up what the chemists physicists call cardice, big lump of CO2 um, with all the uh, white that you see as a result of uh, moisture vapor um, condensing around it. And you will find that uh, it will take up this CO2 at room temperature, and if you take away the so-called cardice, it will give it up. This is the so-called Le Chatelier principle from the um, 19th century, or maybe even the 18th century, in operation. So it's, it's not energy demanding, it just happens spontaneously. Out comes the carbon dioxide when um, there isn't enough to push it in this direction. When there is enough, you get the carbonic acid. And you can use a technique called solid state nuclear magnetic resonance 
and this is before CO2, and then this is after. And this peak here represents the one that is bonded up here. And so you can see it grow in. But if you don't like using fancy bits of equipment, then uh, you can be um, very resourceful and just use what we call an indicator. So here we have a compound called methyl red. When it's in this particular form here, in other words, it's on the basic side, it's yellow. When it's on the acidic side, it is red, or beginning to be red. And so now remember, we generate this acid over here. So what uh, Jeremiah Gassenmuth could show was, we take these uh, yellowish crystals of uh, the um, rubidium MOF uh, CD and expose it to carbon dioxide, and in five minutes, it gets this very deep orange color. Take the carbon dioxide away, and you're back to where you started. So it's, it's almost magic. So to summarize there, we have a situation where um, the properties of CO2 are expressed in what we call a green metal organic framework. Uh, the metal organic framework um, will take up 50 milligrams of carbon dioxide per gram of the framework. Now that's 33 times more than a cylinder of uh, CO2 at ambient pressure. And the color change is very indicative of a chemical process. And reaction occurs in these CD MOF crystals, but not in amorphous material. And so when Jeremiah took the crystals and crushed them up, um, he found that um, they did not take up CO2, this level blue line, the base here, as opposed to when you have off. And the crystals did not change color as a result of uh, exposing them to um, CO2 after they had been powdered up. And so I come back to this illustration of what I've been calling an emergent phenomenon, which is right at the forefront of chemistry today. And it's nothing new, of course. Nothing is new in this world. Science uh, is always reinventing itself. Um, because particularly on the European scene, those that were um, putting together the um, churches of uh, the um, periods of through 1000 AD to, um, well, if you like, the modern day, were putting in stained glass windows where gold was used um, at a nanoparticle level to create uh, this very intense red color. So we have exactly the same thing. Um, there is no gas uptake by gamma cyclodextrin on its own. Um, it um, does certain things that the uh, metal organic framework doesn't do. Namely, it will take up two of these uh, organic molecules. This one lets the organic molecules swim around inside. They effectively go from room to room. They're on a um, bit of a uh, walk around. If you will. And so, <clears throat> it begs the question, uh, if we have this green moth, um, could we get to the point where it might be edible? And so Ron Smoldon one day, um, having acquired some food grade gamma cyclodextrin from the Walker Company, Wacker Company, um, removed the methanol from ob for obvious reasons from the preparation, <coughs> visited a nearby liquor store and um, got some Everclear, which is pretty much 95% uh, ethanol, and at the same time bought some food preservative. And in his kitchen at home, he uh, made some of the CD moth and um, had it for breakfast. Now, somebody's going to ask, what does it taste like? Pretty bland. But remember, we can lace this with anything you want, almost within reason, as long as it's too, not too big. And so the time came uh, to publish it. Now, this was an example where we sent it to nature, and nature sent it back. We're not interested. OK? So again, let me get over the message that uh, you can do something of this ilk and just get it slammed in your face. Anyway, it ended up going to Angavanta Kemi. It got onto the front cover. But what I really want to point out was it was um, just before Labor Day in 2010, and uh, it must have been quite a quiet time. And when the reporter, um, Kenneth Chang, 
phoned up my assistant, uh, Peggy Short from New York, and said, I want to speak to Professor Stodder. I winked at her and said, just say I'm not available. Um, put him through to Ron and Ross and Jeremiah. Why? Because that was their discovery. And I'm a bottom-up person. Let them have the credit. I'm not going to steal the limelight. And so where you can see Smokthorne's name, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Grasson Smith's name, and somewhere buried away Ross's name, this is why. They had a wonderful half hour, or hour I've forgotten, interacting with Kenneth Chang at um, the New York Times. I also got into the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Nature Chemistry, New Scientists. This was the front cover of Angavantica. And uh, people went to town with phrases that uh, bring back Marie Antoinette, so-called, let them eat moths. Um, edible gas storage, edible nanostructures. A moth you can scoff. Metal organic frameworks, making a meal out of moths. And so it went on. But <clears throat> let's come back to reality. It has competitors, and these competitors are, of course, well established, as I said, from the early 90s. It's been an explosive area. Those of them that are these metal organic frameworks uh, derive from petrochemical sources. Um, but the one I've been showing you is the only one that is USP grade and made from USDA um, certified materials. It is safe, it is cheap, um, at the most seven cents a gram. And as you can see, Ron could make it in his kitchen. And this is one of the other requirements, I think, of chemistry if it's going to be successful in a commercial environment. On the one hand, it's got to be complex, like this moth, which is a you know, bit of serendipity. But on the other hand, you've got to be able to make it in one step, a spoonful of sugar, a pinch of salt, and a swig of alcohol. So what could it be good for? Well, let's just, we can think of the pharmaceutical industry, but everybody thinks of that. I'll leave you to have your imagination there. But let's just think what you could do with food products. You could use this to uh, stop the rotting of fruit um, as it makes its way to the supermarket or in the supermarket itself. You could lace um, almost anything you wish with any flavor you wish. In terms of personal care, you could imagine um, putting fluoride into toothpaste uh, using this approach because we don't need to have benzoic acid as a counter ion namely benzoate, uh, we could have fluoride. Um, you could use it in deodorants. And then, since it sequesters gases, it's a good way of uh, taking uh, gases and uh, smells out of the environment. And of course, that's important from the point of view of uh, conditions like asthma, so on and so forth. And remember these jet planes that I was uh, extolling the virtues of at the beginning of my talk, they need to have air handling systems, and maybe this could be another product that could make its way into that arena. All right, so um, I just need three or four minutes if Philip will allow it, uh, because we did start late, Philip, didn't we? So um, I just want to break into my final story on serendipity with the introduction that the world is full of complex networks. We have the World Wide Web. We have stock exchanges in countries all around the world. And then if we're biologists, we note how when birds are migrating, they don't go willy-nilly across the sky. They usually form a V-shape. And there's very good reason for that. But these complex networks are really in advance, very difficult to predict. Prediction is not possible. Uncertainty rules the roost. And the unexpected is always just around the corner. So, we see in chemistry, breaking onto the scene of something called systems chemistry. You'll start to see more and more advertising of positions in chemistry departments where this term is going to be used. Because the time has come for chemists to embrace complexity and invest much more of their time 
into the studying of complex mixtures of interacting molecules. And it means that we've got to go away from what we know and what we've been comfortable doing in the past and do these new things, often driven by serendipity. And a good reason for responding very positively to the intellectual challenge posed by systems chemistry is that complexity very often gives rise to this emergent behavior. So just as in biology, when the birds migrate, they go into a V, we get this unexpected thing when cyclodextrins come together and make this moth. We have a very different situation from the building block that we use to make it. And often this gives rise to this so-called emergent behavior that is not present in any of the components of the mixture, but only comes to light, only is very important, as a result of multiple interactions going to the bigger structure. And so here's one, again, that we stumbled across um, three and a half years ago or so. One of my students, Alex Fade, uh, <clears throat> with the knowledge that uh, if you have molecules that are called donors in terms of uh, being flat and acceptors in terms of being flat. So um, the donors we're going to just represent in red with D here and the acceptors in blue. And they can form stacks that are mixed, DA, 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 right through the crystal. And these are commonly insulators, or they show magnetism, ferroelectricity. On the other hand, if you arrange them as DDDD and AAAA in a segregated stack, this is much more difficult to, to do. Um, they're elusive, uh, but then uh, you have a chance of creating conductors or even superconductors. And so what Alex was doing was um, trying to make some of these mechanically interlocked molecules, these catenates. This is why he has this chain on here. But what happened was that within a very short period of time, a day, two days, um, four days, he has a situation where very long needles are being formed as crystals. And it turns out that they are stacked as donor acceptor, donor acceptor, donor acceptor, like this in the crystal. And the reason, and he coined the term that these were lock arm supramolecular ordering. So lasso, you know, try and get an acronym. That helps sell your work. And this is made up of uh, these donor acceptors where you get this so-called pi pi stacking. And the lock arm provides the hydrogen bonding. And so, what you're looking at here is a bit of a play on DNA. It's very distant from it, but it's uh, the same kind of concept being expressed in a chemical world where we are only writing a phrase that keeps repeating itself like yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. You know, we're back to the 12 year old, uh, sorry, the 12 month, 18 month kid. And this one is not at all porous. We've turned everything on its head. It excludes everything, including solvents. It's just what you see. And <clears throat> he got many of these crystals from working with many pairs of uh, donors, which are the red, and acceptors, which are the blue. And then for our publication in Nature, we chose to highlight these three. And in one of them, as I say, the important thing is the reds and the blues line up along one of the crystal axes. But important to what I'm going to show you in terms of properties is that they're laced together by these dots. These are these hydrogen bonds that hold the structure together. And what's more, in these crystals, some of them, many of them in fact, you get a certain polarizability. And so the donor here is um, effectively giving electrons to the acceptor. And as a result, you get a positive charge created on the red and a negative charge created on the blue. So you got plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. And this is the basis for what we call ferroelectricity. So we have plus minus, plus minus. And as we get this motion, if we um, now apply a very small voltage where <coughs> this blue part will move closer to that red one 
and this one to that one, we change the so-called polarization from in that direction to this direction. And that change in polarization can be expressed at a hysteretic level as we apply the electric field. Now I've got a movie that I hope uh, will show you just what's going on here. So we start, here are uh, Alex's very long crystals, which are very easy therefore to put into a device setting. And here's what's in the crystals, these alternating reds and blues. And if we have electrons go to the blue, as I said, and leave the red with a positive charge and the blue negative charge, but then if we switch the voltage, we get the movement of the red from one blue to the other, all the way along the crystal. And so this is, as it were, uh, ferroelectricity. And what was exciting about this was that um, these hysteretic curves were observable at room temperature. This was the very first time that organic compounds had shown this hysteresis at room temperature. And so this is why, at the end of the day, it made its way into nature back on August 24th. And so again, it's another, I think, story in serendipity. Alex and Alok, with whom he collaborated, Alex is now at the Intel Corporation in Palo Alto. Alok is at Harvard um, with George Whitesides pursuing a postdoc and will no doubt end up being uh, an assistant professor very soon somewhere. Maybe at New York University, Abu Dhabi, if you have your heads screwed on. Very, very bright. So again, simplicity leads to complexity, but it wasn't planned. It came out of just observation by Alex in the first case and Locke following up. So simple organic molecules self-assemble readily. Solvent-free hydrogen bonding networks um, are important in this mission of creating crystals that are ferroelectric, up beyond where we can even do measurements, uh, well above room temperature. And the hysteretic polarization allows reversible switching. And these electronic states of the crystals, moreover, and this is important, persist upon the removal of the electric field. And why is it important? Well, if you think of your cell phone or your GPS or whatever, uh, if you think of uh, so-called cloud computing that is very important nowadays in the storing of data, it's expensive the way we do it at the moment. And in the US alone, 3% of all electricity is consumed by data centers. 10% of server power consumption is wasted by volatile memory. So this means that in order to keep the memory in a particular electronic device, you've got to keep putting in electricity, you've got to keep firing it up from time to time. The great thing about ferroelectricity is you don't need to do this. Um, and then overall, six billion uh, dollars in the US in electricity, they reckon this uh, organization here, Samsung Semiconductor um, organization, could be saved by going over to ferroelectric systems with their non-volatile memory. And so, once again, uh, when it was published, um, its work got considerable amount of attention. Not as much as the Edible Moths, which uh, somewhat surprised me. The New York Times didn't get back to us, nor did the um, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, but um, it sort of made its way in a viral way across the uh, web. So crystals get attention, and I've had enough of your attention. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, the input of uh, the people that named and also the uh, sources of funding, and in particular single out uh, King Abdul um, <coughs> Aziz, uh, Center for Science and Technology in Riyadh, which has been a wonderful major uh, funder of uh, some of the research that I've described to you tonight. And bless them, they were able to go with uh, this whole idea of you start out to do one thing and you find something else. And you've got to keep room in all your research activity for that to happen. And the best way for it to happen 
is to give your young people, be they graduate students, be they postdoctoral fellows, or at an institution like this, be they your assistant professors. Don't try to tell them what to do. Don't try to buy machines that uh, they may never use. Just ask them what their dreams are and what they would like. And don't hesitate. Give it to them. And the world will be the oyster for New York University, Abu Dhabi. I wish you all well. Thank you. My name is Mohammed. I'm a captain with Emirates Airline. I just would like to ask you, what are the applications of the uh, nanopores uh, complexity into the aviation industry in the future? Well, as I um, wanted to point out, um, as far as the edible moths are concerned, I think there are obvious applications in the um, home care industry, the personal care industry, and in food and also in the pharmaceutical industry. I didn't go into that. Um, we see food, uh, personal care, and home care as what I would call the low-hanging fruit. Um, between ourselves, we've been negotiating with uh, our sponsors in uh, Riyadh uh, to uh, create a startup company. I hope we're close to uh, achieving that objective because you know, that is one of the things that uh, you want to come out of research. It's something that uh, be useful to humankind. And then as far as the ferroelectric system is concerned, well, that is up to the intels of this world. Do they want to um, take on this technology or not? Um, we wait and see. You mentioned about the, uh, the carbon dioxide actually by absorbing it or storing it, and then you can actually reverse the uh, chemical reaction. And actually, in the aviation industry, they are using ice from carbon dioxide in the aircrafts. They call it uh, liquid ice to freeze uh, pharmaceutical during transportation to bring it to a very low degrees. Do you think this sort of uh, technology can be used actually to absorb the release of this dry ice later on during the flight? Because we use quite uh, a lot of uh, quantities and then the end of it is just we release it to the atmosphere. So the thing can be absorbed again and can be frozen for a later on future, as you said about the storage. I, I, absolutely. This is, this is part of our dream. We, we just you know, need the um, uh, resource to be able to uh, put these ideas into practice. I, I, I should say that when our paper was published uh, in the August of uh, 2010 and it got so much press coverage, I mean, we were just bombarded with emails, people making um, the kind of uh, suggestions that, you know, with you with your experience made, Mohammed. Um, I mean, there was another very attractive one that uh, I wish we had been able to follow up on very quickly. Uh, someone pointed out that uh, we use sodium bicarbonate in baking and have done for a huge um, long time, I guess. It's part of uh, the folklore of... Uh, the art of baking to uh, you know, put bubbles in uh, cakes and in bread. Um, but the downside there is that you're so using sodium, which is not so good for our heart. Well, if we could take potassium uh, moth with the carbon dioxide uh, trapped in it, you have a completely new technology which might be better for our human health. So th th there's all kinds of, I think, very, very simple uh, applications that could come from what I've been talking about tonight. And thank you for your suggestion. I find it intriguing. Thank you. Brilliant work, as always. Um, I was wondering if you'd done the comparison with your, your CO2 sequestering moth um, uh, with porous rock for this harebrained idea that we're going to put CO2 and store it indefinitely under the ground and, and what your, your moths compared to in terms of the, the, uh, the storage capacity? Yeah, um, I would um, probably um, have to concede that we would have to be looking for a transfer on from uh, what could be 
you know, a very bulky amount of a CD moth to do the sequestering. But then um, the fact that it is released then I think has to um, lead it to another technology for really storing it and getting rid of it from the atmosphere. And so, um, I, I mean, I don't see it being the be all and end all in itself. But as a transfer agent, yes, absolutely. Would you agree? Yeah, I think so. I think that's much more realistic than, you know, seeing mountains of uh, just maize in another form being stacked somewhere. That, that doesn't, at least to me, make a lot of sense. I, I may not see something that is um, technologically obvious to someone else. One of your slides mentioned uh, migration into systems chemistry and the study of emergent properties. Where does those emergent properties link into material science and things like dislocation theory? Where are you looking to find that common ground? Of course, yes. Um, I think that um, you, know, you start to use terminology like systems chemistry you do this in part to try and get people to uh, become engaged in uh, another approach to chemistry. Um, but, you know, I always say there's nothing new in science. Um, you, you can always find examples that precede what uh, is put forward as something new. And so, you know, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, this is the 25th anniversary of the Nobel Prize in Supramolecular Chemistry to Don Cram, Jean-Marie Lane, and Charles Pedersen. Well, all the concepts that um, they brought together had been effectively demonstrated by a German chemist. Again, I'll have a difficulty just getting his name. Um, Friedrich Kramer, who, uh, using cyclodextrins, but, you know, he published for the most part in German, so it didn't make a big impact on the uh, international scene. Um, in the year that Pedersen published his seminal paper in the Journal of American Chemical Society in 1967, Kramer published his last paper in that area. He moved on to study much larger systems um, altogether, DNA and so on. And so, it's very interesting, I find, that um, you know, very often we forget about the achievements of the giants of the past, and you know, we create this, uh, well, this is new. So I, t I take your point that uh, I'm sure there's lots of examples of systems chemistry buried away in the defects of uh, materials, and you know, that, that will be part, I hope, of the enriching of the subject, that they are brought out as uh, examples, just the way I said, um, you know, this red color that you get from putting gold nanoparticles together, this is not um, nanotechnology that's been discovered in the last 25 years. This was discovered uh, over a thousand, maybe 1500, maybe 2000 years ago. I don't know. Uh, people didn't call it, of course, uh, nanotechnology, but that's what it is in modern parlance. So you were mentioning of the, using this sort of technology to store information. And uh, not too long ago, a couple months ago, I read about people using electrons to store. I think they used, uh, they stored four bits of information, yeah. but they had the same problem that you were mentioning of how robust it was. Yes, yes. So, but they didn't mention any sort of vision towards it. Like what was the solution? So I was wondering what your vision of how to make this technology more robust. Would be. Well, um, our, our vision in terms of the systems that we are using, which um, electrons are involved, but the main change is the movement of nuclei. So we have a mechanical action going on. Um, it's still happening at a very small level. It's happening within a cubic nanometer um, in our system. So we can still address uh, that very small level. But the point is, in all the settings that we've used so far, the molecules shake themselves apart. They will switch for 100 cycles. That is no use. 
they've got to switch for trillions of cycles. So we're trying to find um, the um, panacea for uh, this problem um, in the metal organic frameworks. That's our, I think almost, I say at the moment, last port of call. Now I'm fairly con uh, confident that if we can mount these switches in these three-dimensional scaffolds, that we will achieve our objective. The robustness will come uh, into play and uh, we will hopefully be able to make devices that will last through billions of cycles. But you know, it's still a dream, it's still a dream. But you know, the point is that on route, we have discovered so many different things and uh, had so much fun as well. But like, what are the negative sides or the difficulties with the morph, like with production of morph or with the uses of it? Like negative sides or any difficulties with it? So you're asking what are the negative sides? Yeah, if there uh, are any. Are which, which, uh, which one do you want me to talk about? Molecular electronics or uh, metal organic frameworks for, that are edible? Uh, the morphs, the, the edible ones, yeah. Which ones? Uh, the morphs. The morphs. Okay, so yeah, everything has a downside. Um, so since they're made of sugar, um, they're going to be the way we know sugar to be. So you know that if you take a cube of sugar and you start to uh, put a match under it, or what we might call a Bunsen burner, or put it on a gas flame, it's going to get black, it's going to char, and um, you're going to have a very strong, pungent smell. And so our moths are not as um, robust at high temperature as the ones are that are um, made from the petrochemical sources. So there's that downside. The other downside is if we put ours into water, uh, which is a major concern, then they do fall apart because it's just like sodium chloride. It's just like taking common salt. You pour it into water, you swirl it around, and you've got a solution of sodium chloride. We take one of our CD moths, we put it into pure water, swirl it around, and it will dissolve. That is good and that is bad. Um, so. You know, everything comes with an upside and a downside. It may be a very simple question, but uh, what, why do we need both metal, or why are metals and organic materials needed in order to get the properties of MOFs? So you need um, something to be uh, the joint that holds the organic component together. Um, and so we have seen the evolution over the last um, 20 years of a large number of uh, these um, metal organic frameworks where very often the metals, more often than not, are transition metals like zinc. And of course their downside is their toxicity. Maybe not so much zinc, but many of the others that are used. But there is also a burgeoning field of what are called COFs, COF, covalent organic frameworks, and these are all organic. And um, this chemistry is just um, coming um, into fruition now. Um, it's um, very exciting. Um, there's quite a few of my ex postdocs, uh, Will Dishtel at uh, Cornell, is mapping out a stellar career in a few years that he's been an assistant professor, just using this principle of taking organic building blocks that um, react. And the, the, the secret here very often is that um, they react under what we call thermodynamic control. So every time you're making a bond, you're also breaking it. So things can juggle around until you have the thermodynamically most stable structure. Um, so it requires a completely new mindset to the whole art of chemical synthesis. It's not a matter of taking A and B, heating the hell out of them, and hoping that they come together. No, it's a matter of taking maybe A, B, C, and D, and gently um, allowing them, sometimes at room temperature, to react for weeks and get these remarkable structures being formed. 
And so we have quite a difficulty in chemistry at the moment that when we teach the subject, we teach it in one way, which is not relevant to a lot of the cutting edge uh, areas in research. Um, how we get this problem solved, I'm not quite sure, but um, that solution has to come to bear. And I, <clears throat> just as I was coming here, um, sent an article uh, invited um, by Gavanta Kemi, an editorial, to mark the 25th anniversary of the prize in supramolecular chemistry. And, um, you know, in that article, I kind of make the point, apart from uh, talking a lot about systems chemistry, that um, we have got to start and really educate and think differently in terms of the way we do chemistry. Um, you know, we, we're seeing a revolution in our time in the concepts that we should be using and the therefore thinking that goes into what we do. And unfortunately, we still teach a lot of that old stuff that could well be forgotten about, in my opinion. But that's part of the conservative uh, group of people that uh, we chemists are. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering that is it energy intensive to put like certain things into the moths? Because you were describing how it seems very easy that you just put it in the water and then it would just dissolve. So if it's easy to get it out, it is hard to get it in or is it no. very... In? It's very easy to get it in, and so provided you don't, uh, you know, put your moth into water, if you have aqueous alcohol, um, you can just have anything on the outside, provided it's not too big, it has to be under a nanometer in, in, in size. It'll swim in through the uh, cyclodextrin channels, which run all the way down in three directions at right angles to each other, and occupy the space. The interesting thing is, that if the cyclodextrins were not all linked up, um, they would get clogged because uh, many of the organic molecules we know would come and sit, uh, two of them together like this. But that property disappears because it's not one in water, it's this massive great uh, um, you know, connected series and the, 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 the small molecules just swim through all these channels, which is, you know, pretty encouraging from the point of view of, as I say, lacing them with almost anything you want to, provided it's not too big. Yes? Will we be, will we be eating any of your stuff? I mean, any cooperation with the food companies? Um, yes, uh, we are interacting with some food companies in, in the US. We were a little hesitant because we wanted to have our startup company but uh, we've been a little bit frustrated by the time that's taking, and so now we are quite openly speaking to Procter and Gamble and other companies like this. Yeah. I think we have to. <laughs> yeah, this could go on all night, could, Philip. Yeah, thank, thank you very, very much. much. And, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you.